Welcome to another episode of the Dads Making a Difference podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of having a conversation with Matt Morstad. He is the founder of GSD Nation alongside his two boys and dynamic host of the Programming Lions podcast. On that podcast and in GSD, Matt and his boys exemplify both courage and dedication to personal development. Uh, Matt made a career out of solving complex and tricky problems in corporate America, but frustrated with the broad trend of complacency and growing apathy amongst corporate leaders, he decided to exit the corporate world and start a social media platform, GSD Nation, with his sons. Today, we are going to talk about fostering critical thinking skills in children, uh, tackling tough issues and conversations with guests and community members and our children. And we're going to talk about how he has tried to stay the course as a father in leading his sons to become strong young men. This is a fantastic episode where Matt is going to give you some strategies that you can take away right now with your own kids to turn them from consumer to creator and to be mindful of others showing empathy, understanding, and trust as we navigate hard conversations in a complex world. This conversation on the DMD podcast with Matt Morstad starts right now. Matt, welcome to the Dads Making a Difference podcast. Great to see you today. All right. Thanks. Uh, glad, glad to be here. Excited. Man, it's always a blast talking to an, a fellow father who has kids around the same age. We were just chatting before we pressed record. And uh, when we did our, our, I always do Discovery Calls, guys, listening to this, just to make sure that the guests are vetted a little bit coming in so you know that you're getting the best. And Matt is one of the best. I appreciate our conversations and what you have to share. And why don't we start there? Because... You have a unique background. Um, maybe the guys listening to this wouldn't expect a guy who's been super successful in his professional career just to be like, nah, I'm done. I'm going to do this with my kids and, and do a project. So why don't you start there? Tell us a little bit about yourself uh, leading into what you're doing right now. Sure. That sounds great. And again, thanks for having me on. This is exciting. I always love talking about dad work. I think being a dad is the most important thing that we can do. It's a duty. And got to do it right. So my story is, yeah, it's kind of unique. I have spent the last 25 years in corporate America. I was an engineer by education. I ended up really having a knack for problem solving and sometimes solving tricky and difficult problems. And so I found myself to be kind of a scrappy builder, problem fixer in the corporate space. And there's a lot of problems in the corporate space. So I had a successful year over 25 years, a few different companies, progressed up and I was an executive in the last company that I was with and I was there for about 10 years. And so here's where it took a little bit of a shift. I enjoyed my job. I was being compensated well. It was a great company. I would say I was well-respected. I had a huge team and responsibility, but ultimately I just had this sort of intuition that stuff was changing. And part of that was the company was growing and getting larger I was much more comfortable in the culture of a small company, scrappy, where you could really have merit-based policies and accountability and personal responsibility as part of the core cultural tenets of the organization. And I think this happens with any company, but as it gets bigger, Mm -hmm. things get more political, more bureaucracy. Sometimes you don't celebrate the things that you think you should be celebrating in terms of wins and achievements. And so I just found myself starting to be a bit of a cultural misfit with the organization as it grew. And I was in an organization that grew really, really fast. And, mm. and that benefited me in a lot of ways too, because we're a public company. But I had this feeling and I, I had this realization that maybe I have another purpose that I can fulfill. And I have these two young boys and they are 11 and 13 right now. So around the time that I made this decision to shift and move out of the corporate world, it was a couple of years ago because it took me about a year and a half to offload my responsibilities, had a graceful exit, everything was on good terms. But I saw my kids at this very impressionable age. I saw all these crazy cultural things going on in society. And I wanted to make sure that my boys are turning into strong, responsible, confident young men that can be successful in the next generation. And so 
I just felt like for me, that is where my focus needs to be. And so if I can take some time away from my career and work with them and maybe do something and build it together, which I can, I can get into more, that would be where I should be spending my time. So I essentially left the corporate world and I started a social media channel with my kids and we started a podcast. And the reason for that is I came home a couple of times and I watched my kids watching YouTube relentlessly. I'm sure a lot of dads can relate. Yeah. If you give your kids an iPad or anything, they will just go right to YouTube and they'll watch you know, cats on skateboards or whatever it might be. And so this drove me nuts because I found this to be a behavior of consuming content. And so I asked them about, well, how do we turn this into you doing something instead of just watching somebody else do it? And so that's where this idea of building a channel and producing content came into play. Mm -hmm. I told the boys I would rather see them if they want to be, if they idolize YouTubers and influencers, then let's focus on that. Let's spend some time on that. And I'll be happy to help them with that. Mm -hmm. But consuming content is much different than producing content. And so I want my kids to be productive. I want them to learn. I want them to uh, build business skills, operational skills, so that they can be equipped for life as they get older. Yeah. And so uh, hence, we started GSD Nation, our social media brand. And then we also started a podcast. We're currently about 52 episodes into our podcast. We've been at this just under a year. And we talked to all kinds of cool people. So this is the other benefit of being able to break away and do this with my kids. We spend an hour a week with some guest or sometimes just together on a unique topic. And we'll break topics down or we'll talk to guests that have a unique background, unique skill set. They're the best at what they do, perhaps. And it's just such a cool experience for kids to be exposed and get to meet and learn from the best. And so they're getting to do that with me together. And of course, as a family, being a dad with your two boys, building a business, doing a podcast, like we're just spending all this quality time together. In addition to the quality time that we would have spent otherwise playing sports, playing games and all those kinds of things. So I'll, uh, I'll stop there. But yeah, it's, a, it's been a interesting shift in journey. And there's a lot of preparation that took to get to that shift in terms of your financial freedom and so forth. But I'm enjoying it. And we're having a good time. It's amazing. I think there's a lot of guys listening to this who'd be like, I would love to do something like that with my kids, but, and they have a, but right. They have this idea of like, Oh, sure. It sounds great for Matt. He was able to build this uh, thing with his boys. He came home corporate America. Sounds like he did pretty good, but that wouldn't work for me. Mm -hmm. And yet I think they're glossing over the fact that you had an opportunity to prioritize what you felt was most valuable to you and most important to you. And you took that and it doesn't necessarily mean the same for everybody else. The risk is different for everybody and we can get into that. But at the end of the day, you made a decision for yourself to say, I'm going to do this with my kids. And I love that you said, I want my kids to be creators, not consumers, because right now I shared with you a little bit before we press record that I'm in education. And one of the things that we see is a lot of consumer behaviors in kids. And it's very concerning to me as a father, if my kids are just consuming, consuming, consuming. Yeah. And I love that you pushed your boys to say, no, we're going to be creators. And I love the GSD. Getting stuff done. Yeah. Getting, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you could, you could, you could yeah, yeah. yeah. Swap, swap out the S. But sure. Yeah. So, but we're going to get stuff done. We're going to be productive. We're going to have meaning. We're going to have purpose in what we're doing. We're not just going to sit and scroll to death and, and I appreciate that. So uh, not a question, but just a statement of like how important that is to take that step out with your kids. Now, the question is, when were you sold that like this was the thing to do? Because I think there's guys listening to say, hey, that sounds great. I would love to do this. But and, and they have some doubts. But when were you sold to say like, nope, this is what I'm going to do. I'm committing to this. Uh, let's go. Well, it was quite a process. I think it would be irresponsible for any father to come home and say, I've had an epiphany. I don't like my job. I'm going to quit and do this thing with my kids, or I'm going to start something else. You've got to be thoughtful because you've got a duty and responsibility in many cases to support the family or contribute to supporting the family. And I'm certainly in that case. And so it took a lot of dialogue with my wife, who's great, but we 
made sacrifices along the way. I, I would say I've made sacrifices even like well prior to this to put myself in a situation where I could break away. And financial freedom is, is a big part of it, right? It's difficult to detach yourself from the hive or whatever you want to refer to it as, or the corporate chain. In a lot of cases, you've got to have financial freedom to do that. But there, so for me that, that worked, but it was a, that was like a multi-decade process. I, I started saving as much as I could when I was younger and that's a delayed gratification type of thing. And so if you've done that great, maybe you're on your path, but the way I've always thought, and maybe this is an interesting thing to talk about, which is the way I've always thought about being wealthy is when I'm at a point where my passive income, income coming in from my investments, and those investments might have varying risks and returns, outweighs my burn rate or my spend rate or my necessary spend rate in my you know, home and family and mortgage and all of those types of expenses, excluding my earned income. So hmm. if I have investment coming in, investment income coming in that can support my lifestyle, I'm wealthy. The great thing about this definition of passive income being more than your burn rate is you can have a $40,000 passive income and a low burn rate and you're wealthy. Now, it really depends on how you want to live. And so for me over the years, I really just scaled how I want to live and how much I want to put away. So every time, for example, I get a bonus at work, that is to me just like extra money. I put it away into passive income streams. Anytime I get a stock grant, put that away into passive income streams. And so I've been able to do that for a while and put myself in a situation where I could step away. So, and some of the, there's some luck in that too, right? I, I worked yeah. at a company that stock price went bananas. And so that helps. Uh, I live in an area where our home valuations went up considerably. So that helps. So there's a little bit of luck involved. I can't lie. But even if I, let's say, didn't have financial freedom, I think the alternatives would be allocating your time differently. So you mm -hmm. could just peel out certain aspects of your time. And I started sort of sampling with this. Like I would block off my schedule at work for portions of the day and I would see like, okay, now I'm going to go and you know coach my kid's football team, for example. And I can break away and allocate certain time to do these things with my kids or do some other activity and not have it distract me from my my corporate job or earned income. So I think you can just be methodical about it. Uh, definitely don't want to jump to any quick conclusions, but it's something you got to really think about, talk with your spouse or whatever, and just build a plan. And even when I said I decided I wanted to leave my corporate gig, I decided a year and a half before I actually left. And so that whole process was drawn out. I approached the executive team and mentioned I want to transition out. And so I think that is a responsible way to do it so that you, you know, don't put yourself in a tough spot. I love that you equated to that investment of time piece because so easy we jump to money. Oh, they have money so they can do this. But it's that prioritizing that, you know, time is one of our most valuable assets. And if you're able to, even where you're at, whether you consider to be wealthy or not wealthy, and you're still in that earning phase, if you're able to invest time in what you feel is most important and what you prioritize, it's amazing what that does for your own growth, your family's growth and the growth of your kids. It doesn't always have to be financial. Of course, that helps. Uh, but I love that you said you were able to, even when you're in the midst of it and busy, able to invest that time into being present yeah. and like coaching and things like that. So I love yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. And you can start a business that's very low lift and low time commitment. For example, if you want to do something like what I'm doing, starting a business with my kids to teach them entrepreneurial skills or whatever. And so you can start that uh, low lift. You would have to do it full time right away. You can start it. And then as it grows and it starts getting income, well, then you have this sort of off ramp. And, and I think just really thinking methodically about like what, what point would this new business have to have a level of income that I could break away from the other thing. And so those are trade-offs that uh, I think people just got to weigh out. Yeah. I love it. Okay, I want to ask you this question because this hot topic right now, you know, you started a social media account and a YouTube account with your kids. 
in a time where everyone's trying to push kids off of social media. And so there's a, there's a lot of conversation right now about this device is ruining my kids. YouTube is distracting my kids. It's distracting them from being who they need to be. And a lot of parents are looking at this as like an emergency scenario where I need to protect my kids from screens. And yes. you took the flip side and you said, no, we're going to, we're going to utilize something that you're interested in and make you a creator. Yeah. How, what, have you had any pushback or feedback from people who are like, I can't believe you did this with your kids. Now they're just diving in their computer all the time. Yes. Big time. Actually. <laughs> now I do think there's, I totally understand why people want to keep their kids off of screens. And I think that the exposure to social media for kids is really, really dangerous. And it's really, really addictive as you know. And so for me though, what I looked at is, well, am I going to be able to change that? Or can we embrace this addictiveness around the device and turn it into more of a productive outcome versus a consumption model outcome? Hmm. And so that's, that's why we, we did what we did. But there are certain trends in life that you just, you just have to look at, I think, and say, can we fight this trend? Or can we somehow navigate it to optimize our personal situation within this trend. And that's how I see social media or the digital age, for example. I really think the future is social media, digital marketing, digital sales, digital advertising, digital courses, training, and you know, you have coming maybe from an educational background, like these are areas that are exploding. And so, yes, I get a lot of feedback that my kids shouldn't be involved in this, but Again, I see my kids being more on a production model versus a consumption model or a creator model versus consumption model. And so they still get on YouTube and they'll scroll around, but they're doing it with a bit of a different thought. Sometimes they'll see something on YouTube and they'll, they'll go, oh, I like that. That's interesting. We could make a post similar to this. Yeah. And so now they're, instead of just mindlessly scrolling and being zombies and degenerates, they're using that and maybe feeding it back into the beast. And so there are times where I have mixed feelings about, well, are we just feeding the beast? Because now I've got yeah. kids creating content that other people are going to consume. And so that's definitely been a talk for us in terms of what do we want to produce? Because early on, when I talked to my kids about this, oh, let's just you know do dumb stuff because that's what all these big YouTubers do. They, they right. make dumb TikToks and, and <laughs> people mindlessly scroll. And that was ruled out immediately by my wife and I, because we don't want to promote just putting uh, silly stuff out there. So we want to put something out of value. Hence, the title of our channel is Getting Stuff, Getting Sh Done Nation. Yep. So we want to do things that are productive. And that comes in mind, body, spirit. And so we'll talk a lot about habits, ideas, policies. We've actually talked a lot about politics lately on our channel. And that like that has a lot of people in an uproar, mm -hmm. uh, getting kids involved in politics. But candidly, I think it's an interesting time. This is probably one of the most pivotal elections, at least in my lifetime, that's happening right now in the United States. And so educating kids and having them understand the differences between policies, practices, candidates, and everything is interesting and they're going to learn and I'm learning along with them. So kind of a lengthy answer, but I do think they're building skills in this digital space that is, is going to be beneficial to them in the long term because I see the future of jobs for gen alpha largely mm -hmm. being in this space. Mm -hmm. I agree. I'd love your take on something because I had a conversation recently and this is like dad stuff. I had a conversation with my daughter. She, my daughter's 12, does not have her own cell phone, has never asked for her own cell phone. Actually for her 12th birthday, she asked for a pull-up bar. <laughs> that's what oh, she asked I for. I love that. Yeah, because yeah. she's a competitive climber. So that's what she wanted. And I was waiting for the oh. cell phone request and it didn't come. Yeah. So it was good. Okay, uh, and we we have a phone in the in the home, an extra cell phone. It's probably like an iPhone 7 or something that she uses. Mm -hmm. Um but it's in public spaces, not in her room. Like it's in, everybody uses it. My son, her, whatever. It's like her home phone. But where we are, where we live right now, we have a policy put in place in schools that's 
no devices. So no personal devices, uh, no handheld devices. You can use your laptop, things like this. Yeah. And people have said, hey, what's your take on it? And my take on it is that I don't like it and I like it. And yeah. I, I'd like to just share a little perspective, but I want you to push back if you think I'm off here because I feel right now we're in a time where it's all about the orientation to the device. Mm -hmm. It's kids right now, what I see in youth in the, my line of work is that the orientation to the, the to the device is a entertainment tool, not a learning tool. Right. It's an entertainment tool, not a production tool. Yes. And they are, like you said, the consumer, not the creator. And I think I like what is in place with no devices because of that. We need to shift the orientation of what this tool can be used for. And yeah. in those conversations, we can make a directional shift to the orientation of this is a device that has an incredible power that we can use as a tool to, I love what you said, in all these areas, be productive, uh, improve mind, body, spirit, and dive into politics and be a like critical consumer of information of what's right and what's not right. And what's, you know, is this a little off the wall? Who created this? Where did it come from? Like, yeah. just be a critical consumer. So right. what, what's your take on that right now? Because we live in different countries, I live in Canada, but we are yeah. very tuned into what's happening south of the border. But I think right now for our youth, internationally, it's an important time for us in this, how are they using yeah. devices? Yeah, I fully agree. I don't think devices have any place in schools or the classroom. They're a complete distraction. If you give kids the free will to use their device, they will mindlessly scroll and consume content. Yeah. And so that will be an absolute distraction in school. And then they also communicate with each other between classes mm -hmm. uh, while they're in class or whatever. It'll be, it'll be just completely distracting from their ability to learn. And so I think and this is the same policy we have at the school that our kids are in, which we love. There are no devices in the classroom. Before and after school, you can have your phone. And my kids don't have a phone yet. Uh, they have smart watches, so they can kind of emergency, we can get a hold of them. But yes, it's. Uh, I think it's incredibly distracting. It is a powerful tool. And we see technology in a lot of classrooms in some of the public schools here. And so I get the benefit of that. But you've got to put a lot of controls and management over it so that they can use it in a productive method versus other. And so I'm with you. I think it, it just has no place in school. And it's really wild. I see so many young people everywhere mm -hmm. with a phone in front of their face. They're out for yeah. a walk. Phone, yeah, phone in front, in front of their yeah. face. They'll be <laughs> yeah. at the gym. Two friends working out together. Both of them are on their phone while they're working out. I don't know what they're getting done. And so I don't want to sound like an old man. I know I do a bit, but <laughs> I really think that people need to go on social media slash technology detox programs and use these devices at specific times, allocations. Otherwise, it's so addictive. And we know it's addictive. More studies have been done than I can count in terms of the addictive nature of cell phones, social media, and the dopamine rushes you get, you get a little heart or whatever, on it, or you get a text message from somebody. So in my opinion, and the way that I use social media is I bucket certain times of the day where I will get on my phone and, and I run a social media channel now Yeah, where we get on and look at comments, respond and so forth. But if I'm on all the, all day, I get nothing done. Yeah. And it just completely changes the outcome of my day. Yeah. So how do those conversations go with your boys? So now you run a social media account, you have the YouTube channel, you want to get stuff done. And then how do you navigate that piece of, I don't want to say guarding your kids. I think that's the wrong way to put it. Like we're not putting a, a firewall in front of our kids. They need to learn how to navigate stuff. But how do you have conversations with your boys saying, Hey, this is where we're at. Uh, we dive into social media, you're on YouTube, you're seeing other things that inspire you to become a creator, what works, what doesn't. It's yeah. very easy for them. They're youth, you know, they're young to be able to slide back into the, just the, the consuming model. Like, so how do you, how often do you address that? How do you dig into that? Yeah, I'd say we address it almost every day, but certainly yeah. on a weekly basis because they, like most kids, they'll have free time to do things as they want. And Inevitably, when they have free time, they want to go on 
YouTube or go on the iPad and watch other people do stuff. Yeah. So we certainly, we limit that time, but then in off time, we'll talk to them because we have little business meetings and we'll talk about strategy. Well, who's our next podcast guest or what types of topics might we want to cover? And so those are opportunities where I can ingrain a few ideas in their heads mm. around, hey, next time you're on social media, maybe you should look for some content that is related to this topic that we might cover. So that's one way we do it. The other way we do it is we actually will talk about it and then we'll record it. And so I've, I've, for example, recorded a podcast about social media just with my kids in terms of what their thoughts are on it. And I'll ask and we'll have some dialogue back and forth. And, and we've had other guests on that have expertise in this matter. And so I think that's also a good way for them to learn hearing from not just their dad in terms of how damaged it can, it can be, but an expert or a teacher, for example, that we had on a, a while ago. So I think just communication about it is key. And I'm always communicating with my kids. I see them every morning. We talk, we have breakfast mm -hmm. together, we have dinner together. When they get home from school, we talk about their homework. And then we'll talk about our business a bit, usually every day, how things are going, what's happening on the channel. And so the more that we can talk and have dialogue, the more opportunity I have to guide them in terms of how they're thinking about different things. Yeah, I love it. I'm glad you just said what you did because that was where I was going next. As a dad that is building something with his kids and they they probably super excited about it and they want to check it out and you're doing this together, it'd be really easy to allow that to like be overbearing the conversation. That's what you talk about all the time. So as a dad you know, you're still that like you're raising young men and you want them to grow into responsible older men and build relationships and like wrestle and do all those types of things. Mm -hmm. You know, how, do, how do you turn it off? How do you make sure that the business doesn't consume that father son uh, relationship? And then that can still be authentic and natural. That's a really, really important question. And I've actually found myself struggling with that time to time because I am a bit obsessive about things. I, mm -hmm. I like to say that I've had a successful career. And a lot of that's because I'm obsessed. Like I want results. I want to make sure we get things done. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's, I love it. <laughs> and so I, I definitely get obsessed about things and I get that way about our channel. I think now this is our business together. And my vision for it is that I'm helping build this. And then eventually the boys take it and run with it. And they might change the dynamic or the direction or the themes that they cover but ultimately like like I'm just want to help them create a future path and so yes I get obsessed about that to the point where I could easily talk about that and not, nothing else with the boys in the morning at night and everything so I just have to like do a little out-of-body experience say what's important for them right now what's important for us I do think talking about our business is important, but we really try to bucket those times. So I'll, I have business meetings scheduled with them twice a week. That That is like focused business time, because I also want them to be in the mindset of creating a habit loop where this time every Wednesday is when we talk about the business and every Saturday, this is when we talk about the business. And this is the time of the week that we record a podcast with a guest. So kids are very routine based. And, and so I've just found that that really works with them. And so I'd really try to isolate when we talk about the business at those times. And it also lets them have the rest of the time to do all the kids stuff that they want to do. So that's how I do it. And my philosophy is when they get home from school, I'm always try to be as curious as I can about their day, what they're doing, the more that they can talk to me, the more I learn about them. And the more they open up and the more our relationship gets tighter. So mm. for example, they'll come home and I'll have school. Mm, fine. And if, you, if I ask some more exploratory questions, what happened on the playground today? How was practice? Who ran the ball the best at football practice? How did you throw it? Like um, the more exploratory questions I ask, you find that they open up and they start talking about things. And so that's what I try to do with them and have them talk about things that they're interested in. Even things that I might not be interested, like my oldest place, Dungeons and Dragons. And it's not really my thing, Yeah, <laughs> but I'll say, Hey, tell me about the latest weaponry you're developing for Dungeons and Dragons. And, and then of course he gets excited and he tells me all about it. So I think those are 
areas that dads can always really try to improve and ask kids questions about things that they're interested in. Yeah. Fascinating. I just, I try to do that too. You know, the generative questions where they're open-ended, it's not easy because you know, you and I are dads We're tired mm-hmm. sometimes at the end of the day, but so it's like, how's your day? Good. Fine. Okay. Awesome. You know, but it was yeah. the best part of your day. And then my son's in a space right now. It's like recess. I kicked the soccer ball. She said it skipped off this puddle and went like, and he'll get all into it. Yeah. Oh, awesome. What's something new that you learned today? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> you know, so like he's there <laughs> right. right now. Right. Um, and, that, but my daughter loves to just like sit and talk and that's where she's at. And as a 12 year old, I love it. You know, yeah. she'll just sit and talk while we're making dinner or at night tucking her in or, and, and I love it. But at, there's times where I have a conversation with them. I hear about their day. I leave the room, say goodnight, go upstairs. And in my head, I start to spiral. I'm like, this world is going to destroy my kids. <laughs> but like, it's not going to. It's like, trying the, to. It's trying. It, it, uh, that's where I'm heading, right? Because w- we had a conversation a couple a couple weeks ago. And I just like, I know the world's not going to destroy my kids. But there are things that they are beginning to encounter, even at 10 and 12, that we're having some pretty in-depth conversations. Um, yeah. what are you seeing on your end as a dad right now? What are you navigating that you're like, okay, we, we have to hit this head on. This can't wait for the 16 year old conversation or 18 year conversation, like 10 and 12, 11 and 13. This is where we're going. Yeah, that's a good question. And, um, well, yes, there are a lot of things stacked against kids in our children's generation, gen alpha. So for me, yes, it's it's a matter of they learn some things in school and there are also skills that they need to learn at home with their parents or from their friends about life and and how to navigate things. And there's you know social, cultural things that are going on. Um so I will I will talk about a few. And one of them is the government and how they're operating and what they're doing and what that does to our kids' future. And so that's one reason why we've put a particular interest into even our, our political mm-hmm. races and so forth that are going on. Because my kids have a genuine curiosity about politics, the economy, how things work, what president is going to get us to the next level. Yeah. And so I found myself spending a lot of time with them explaining how certain things work, like inflation like the monetary system, for example. And when we talk about inflation, I, it's, it's a difficult topic, right? It's kind of yeah. advanced. And so I find myself usually putting it into terms that they can understand. So we play Monopoly a lot at home. And Monopoly is a great game that you can use to explain inflation to your kids and what it does to people in different parts of society or different parts of the game, for example, because Monopoly has built in inflation. Every time you go around the board, you get more money injected into the system or they have a, they have a uh, money card and they throw up money and you get money. So it's just like a money injection. And so then I can talk about those situations with my kids in terms of, well, what happens to the players in the game, depending on if they have assets, meaning they have properties or not. And inevitably what we come to is, wow, inflation really, it makes things more expensive. And then it makes the people that have property put more stuff on their property. It makes the rents higher. And then the people that don't have property, they get crushed. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's a great example of how we've talked about inflation in our house and what it's doing to society and what it's doing to their generation because it's only getting worse. Right. And- so that's one example. Obesity is another. Fitness, food, social media we talked about already. Um, I'd say the other big one that comes up is health and fitness and what kids are eating that we talk about mm-hmm. and how a lot of our food is poisoned. You know, in Canada has stricter rules than we do in the U.S. in terms of what kind of substances are and pres- preservatives and toxins are in the food. But we eat pretty clean. Mom mm-hmm. cooks a lot. And when we go out, we, we really tend to not eat fast food or foods that are going to be you know, damaging to our system. And, and so that's another massive trend right now. More than half the kids in the United States are clinically obese. Mm-hmm. And so it doesn't mean that we have to 
shame people that are in this category, but yeah. we certainly need to be educated in terms of our kids. And I think it's okay for our kids to help educate other kids in terms of what eating right can do for them. So I guess to sum up your question, because it's a, it's a deep one, but there are a lot of things going on. I think that economic policy, inflation, what it's going to take for kids to be successful in the next generation is a huge factor. And the more that we can talk to them now about it, the more we're going to prepare them because there's a lot of things stacked up against them. The, the, the path to success is way harder now than it was for me hmm. and my parents' generation. Like it's, it's going to cost my kids eight times their annual, annual salary to buy a home. It cost me two to three. Right. Uh, same with a car and groceries and everything. They're going to, in, in most households, they're going to require two people to work just to live. And so we're creating this sort of slave system because of inflationary environments. And so it's important for my kids to know that so that they can operate around it. Well, this is why it's important to be an entrepreneur, perhaps, mm -hmm. because you can create your own path. And fit, physical fitness, obesity, these are trends that are going in absolutely the wrong direction. And so the sooner we can get them on a path to having a strong you know, mind-body connection, the better. So an example of things that I do, besides what I mentioned in terms of eating right, I exercise with my kids. They go to CrossFit with me. I switch off every day of the week and they go with me. Now, do I want to go to CrossFit every day of the week? <laughs> Not really, but <laughs> I find it to be a bit of a duty and obligation if my kids will go with me, but they get up, they yeah. go with me at 5 a.m. every morning to CrossFit and they get functional exercise that way. So if I can ingrain habits of eating right, physical fitness, financial literacy at their age, I feel like they are going to have a massive leg up on other, other youth. So, yeah, I, man, I love that. There's so much there that I could, um, I'd love to unpack with you, but I know, right. <laughs> but, but I'm, I'm finding we're diving into very similar conversations. Um, you know, like I said, we're in Canada, but we watch the upcoming uh, presidential race very closely. Uh, you know, you see the debates and my, my daughter's like, why are there two people arguing on TV? And then we get into that. And it, it's just like this whole idea of like what's happening in the world and how it impacts us. My kids are very uh, interested in the conflicts that are happening around the world right now. And yeah. mainly because we, we see an increase in uh, people moving to our city and coming in. My kids are making friends and like my daughter's closest friends are from Syria and Jordan wow. and Nigeria and like and so there's kids from all over the place and so I just we have some pretty deep conversations and I'm like how how deep do I go with them and I've found that their readiness level they just will tune out if I get too yeah. too ver verbose yeah. with them but I love what you said too about involving them in the physical fitness and the healthy eating I'm passionate about that have been for a long time I think I told you I think a long time ago on our other call that. I started fight that ad bod back in 2015. So yeah. fitness, online fitness and nutrition coaching for fathers and families. And so, right. and, and that's been awesome, but I'm finding even personally now that just modeling it for my kids isn't enough, but it's engaging and doing things with my kids and yes. wading into the hard conversations as a dad and wading into the, I don't do daily CrossFit with them, but like doing daily exercise and workouts with them, even right. when you don't want to. And it's okay to say, no, man, you know, I'm super tired this morning, Bray. And my son's name is Braylon. Uh, I'm super tired this morning, man. But yeah, let's do it. Let's do yeah. it anyway, because I know it's important. And then modeling that and getting in there with them. So I appreciate you sharing where you're at with that. Because I think as a dad in my mid 40s right now, I'm also like, how much do I involve them in? How much do I protect yeah. them from? And, and this transition of choosing it's a, their own It's path. a tricky one. There are a lot of advanced topics and things going on in mm -hmm the world. And I have biased on the side of talking to them about anything and everything if they're open and interested. And yeah. so I will sort of gauge their curiosity about it. So for example, kid comes home and says, Dad, what's like, well, how does a, like this abortion topic work? Yeah. Okay, well, let's let's talk about it. And I try to approach it in a critical thinking format. Of course, mm -hmm. I have beliefs about it. Or ideologies about it, for example. But really, if you walk them through a number of questions, you can kind of help them get to uh, a place of understanding that, that that they maybe innately believe or understand. 
And if they ask you how you believe about it, then I think you can be honest and say, well, this is how I think about it. Right. But yes, that, like, that's a topic we you know, have yeah, a lot of wild yeah. stuff going on in the political sphere. And so we talk about a number of those things and we even talk about them on our podcast. Yeah. Yes. We talk about it on our social media channel. A lot of people have objections to that because they don't agree with our political stance perhaps, but they're learning a lot. And I would rather have them learn while we can be together and do it than learn it from somebody else. Yeah. So uh, if they find you know different information at some point than what we talk about or get into at home, then that's fine. But I feel like I'm in a unique position where I can spend the time with them and really try to break things down so that we can all understand it. And sometimes they bring up points that I didn't consider. And so yeah. I think we're all getting better as part of it. Yeah. Amazing. I love that. So you have the podcast, you have these topics and the fact that now that your, your sons have exposure to people in other walks of life who they get to interact with and ask them questions, I think yeah. that just shows such a, an appreciation for where other people are at. Agree with them or disagree with them. Yeah. Being able to have a conversation and ask yes. questions and seek understanding, I think is such a powerful practice. Like we, we recently, we've had conservative politicians on our channel we just had an anti-maga person mm. on the channel we just had a trans woman on our channel that i'll be publishing soon and so yeah you think about like like we're you know crazy topics for kids to get involved with some people might say that's a little advanced but it, it's it, it, they're learning there it's it's really yeah. interesting exposure for them to be able to learn and have conversations also when you talk to real people about these topics, it gives you more empathy. So when you talk to a trans woman that has gone through um, tr transition mm -hmm. and what that meant, why, and it gives you a different level of understanding and empathy. It may not change your feeling about it. However, like it really, it makes you a better person because it feels like you, you have a more well-rounded understanding of the situation. And so yeah. Now that might be more extreme than a lot of dads want to get into, but that's what we do. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Uh, question for you as a dad right now, what is one area that you're diving into an area of growth or learning that personally you're diving into that you're excited about right now? Okay. Well, it's very fitting for this discussion because I find when I listen to myself, either on our podcast or when I guest on other podcasts, I get frustrated. I wish I was more articulate. I wish I was sharper. I wish I was tighter in how I describe things. I have a lot of filler words. So I am going through Toastmasters. I'm trying to really dial in my ability to speak more precisely. I, of course, talked a lot in my corporate career, but there wasn't a lot of pressure, right? It was, you know, usually our own staff and team. So I do want to get better at that. And I told the kids that I'm going through this and I learned things there that I can bring home and we can all get better as part of it. So that's, that's the main thing I'm working on. Yeah. I love it. I, I, I gotta tell you though, this, I appreciate hearing the human side of a conversation. Like refinement is great, but refinement without personality is the worst. <laughs> so you, I love your, I love the personality you bring and, and the openness. So I appreciate that. Uh, Matt, if somebody's listening to this right now and they want to learn more about the project you have going with your boys, or they want to connect with you and learn more about you, where can they do that? Well, the place we're most active right now is Instagram. And so you can look us up as my GSD nation and you'll see like a big orange G with our faces there. That's where we are most active. We're also on YouTube. We have a pretty good uh, channel there and a lot of the same content we put on YouTube also under my GSD nation and our podcast. If you want to listen to the podcast, that's where we go deeper on topics beyond mm -hmm. sort of short, short form material. We also uh, do our podcast in audio and video. So that's on YouTube in video format on audio. It is on Apple, Spotify, all of those under the podcast title programming lions. So programming lions is about taking these little lion cubs and building them into strong adults. Amazing. Matt, thank you so much for taking some time away from the family to do this with us today. I'm excited to dive in and I'm going to listen to more of the episodes and you and your boys as you're on this project. Can't wait to stay connected and see where this goes. So thank you for being here. Amazing. Well, thanks for having me on. It was great.